Welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're talking about shopping for law school essentials, everything from backpacks to highlighters. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience, so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, Bar Exam Toolbox, and the Catapult Conference. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're talking about law school essentials, the stuff you might want to buy to support you as you kick off your law school experience. So Lee, what is first on your list? What do people definitely need if they're heading to law school soon? Well, it might seem kind of silly, but you really need something to carry all of your stuff. (laughs) So you need some sort of a backpack or a rolling bag. And this is something that is actually really popular to Google because uh, we have a post on this about the different backpacks and rolling bags you can buy. And it always comes up as one of our most popular posts. It's true. Yeah. So... What did you use to carry all of your stuff in law school? Well, I remember I actually spent a lot of time and energy thinking about this. Um, I'm not (laughs) sure I made the absolute best. I didn't necessarily make the best decision, probably not for my body, but I actually got a custom made uh, Timbuk2 messenger bag where you could Mm -hmm. pick your colors and pick your fabric. I mean, I spent really a lot more time than I'd like to admit deciding which color I wanted (laughs) and which, you know, which fabric and uh, it was a little ridiculous. I mean, the bag is great. I still have the bag. It lasted three years of law school. It never fell apart. The problem is you're carrying these really big books around. And I'm not sure that a messenger bag is necessarily the best option. I mean, I was lucky in that I lived only half a block from law school. So I would often go back between classes and drop off one book and get another book mm-hmm. just because I couldn't really carry them. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I started law school with a Timbuktu messenger bag as well that I'd already had. (laughs) But uh, if you've never shopped at Timbuktu, I highly recommend it. Um, It's also a San Francisco store. It is a San Francisco store. That's probably why we both had them. Probably. But um, I also struggled with just the amount of stuff that I ended up carrying. And so then I went back to Timbuktu and I ended up getting a backpack um, instead, which Mm. was a little better ergonomically. But even... I mean, you just put too many of those law books in a backpack. You can't carry that without hurting yourself either. Or without, also without crushing your computer, which is a problem. Right, which is a problem. Um, and so I used to drive to school because school was a little far to walk, especially with all the books <laughs> that I ended up carrying. And I used my car as a locker for a while. And then my school actually had lockers. So we would, you know, I just carry in all the books for the day and drop them off in my locker in the morning. It felt a lot like high school. Yeah, I actually refused to get a locker. I mean, we had the option and lots of people did it, but I was just like, you know what? I can't, I can't go back there. I just can't have a locker. (laughs) Well, I didn't really. You might might get a good sense. I was more about like, you know, my law school style than actual practicality. (laughs) Yeah, I know. It, it. It definitely was a throwback to a different time when you start, you know, doing your combination lock and all of that stuff. But I was surprised at the amount of junk that I took with me every day. And it, one of the other things that we'll talk about is about food. But I would oftentimes bring food for part of the day or all of the day if I had a night class later in the evening. And so, I mean, I had a lot of stuff that I would bring with me um, to school. And so you do want to think about how you're practically going to manage all of that stuff. And before you invest a lot of money into some sort of bag, just logistically think about whether or not you want to see how you know school works out a little bit before you dump money onto a rolling bag. I mean, a rolling bag might be great unless you realize that rolling it up a big hill to get to your classes still means that you can't uh, really pack what you need to in it. Or maybe you find that you work at school all the time, so you can leave your books in the library or in, leave your books in your locker after you've worked in the library. You you don't really know before you start. Right. I think it's hard to predict. I mean, you know, everybody has this vision of what their life in law school is going to be like, but you've got to be realistic too. I mean, you know, there's always the debate about could you possibly see yourself carrying around a rolling bag, but hey, I mean, you know, if that improves your life and makes it easier, go for it. Yeah, exactly. 
The other thing, and this is one of my pet peeves of backpacks as a woman especially, is make sure that whatever, if you decide you're not going to carry a separate purse, that you have enough compartments for all of your stuff. Because I made the mistake of buying a backpack that was nice and big, but didn't have enough compartments for things. And then your wallet, and I wear glasses, and so like a glasses case and a wallet and keys, and all this stuff is like floating at the bottom of the bag, and you again don't want to put your laptop on top of your glasses case and all of that kind of stuff. So right. Just think about making yeah, sure, sure. That whatever you buy has enough compartments for everything. Yeah, one uh, one series of bags that I found useful, particularly for traveling and things, it might be an option for some people. It's called the Bagalini. Mm. I think it's, uh, I mean, these are honestly not necessarily the absolute most stylish things you've ever seen in your life, but they're not that bad. And they were designed by flight attendants. Mm. And so... As a result, they have all of these things. You know, they have a key fob so you can attach your keys. They have places to put your cell phone. They have places to put your wallet. Um, they have outside pockets or, you know, outside pockets that zip and things like that. So if you have a Metro card and you don't want to be digging through your bag when you're trying to get on the Metro, it's like, oh, it's right there. You just unzip the outside pocket, take out the card, get onto the subway, put it back in your bag. Mm-hmm. Um but I do think you have to be deliberate about thinking about things that are going to make your life easier because otherwise you're constantly going to be trying to find your keys and that is not conducive to happiness. No, and if you're going to be taking a lot of public transit, you really need to make sure that you've got your gear going on because the last thing you need is stuff falling out in the subway station while you're digging, trying to find your metro card, and it's just it's not going to go well. Right. If you're going to be on crowded trains, you know, a backpack is probably better than a messenger bag because at least you can take that off and put it by your feet. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to think about what your life is actually going to look like. You know, if you're going to commute to school and drive, that's a totally different setup than somebody who's going to be taking the subway in New York City at rush hour back and forth to school. Right. I recently invested in some Bluetooth headphones. And one of the things that I am finding really fascinating about not having the headphone cords is how logistically easier it is when you're carrying a lot of stuff (laughs) to not have headphone cords everywhere because you don't get eyes and maybe I'm just a little cutsy but I always seem to get my phone and my headphone cord like wrapped up in my purse or my backpack (laughs) I still carry backpacks places my backpack shoulder straps or or you get in a car and the uber and it's so anyway things you can do to simplify moving from place to place with lots of stuff, I think can be really helpful. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have a backpack and a purse type bag, you you probably want to be able to combine those, for example. So if I'm taking my laptop and I don't necessarily want to unpack everything into it, I make sure that the bag that I carry as a purse can go inside the backpack. Yep. And then when I get, yeah, I get to the cafe and I take everything out, it's a lot easier than if I'm wandering down the street carrying like three different bags. <laughs> right. I feel like that just... I mean, I also just feel like that really makes you a target, Mm -hmm. you know? And if you're carrying a laptop and you're carrying an expensive cell phone, like, you want to make sure that you're not, to the extent possible, a bigger target than you need to be. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, What about briefcases? I think a lot of people wonder if they have to have a briefcase to take to business events or to interviews. Do you think that people need to invest in a briefcase? I wouldn't say a briefcase necessarily. I mean, maybe if you're a guy. Um, I mean, what I had, which I found effective, I have two ideas on that, particularly for women. So what I actually had was a leather bag that was sort of a, you know, like a female style. It wasn't a briefcase, but it was like, you could carry it at an event, but you could also fit an iPad or a laptop into it Mm -hmm. or a book or something. And so that I found was pretty effective even then, I'm not necessarily sure I took that like to an interview because it was kind of big. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can also make do with a nice leather folio, yeah. you know, just the sort of thing that folds so that you can carry around a copy of your resume, you know, your writing sample, whatever it is that you need, a pen, a way to take notes, something like that. I mean, you don't want to show up to, you know, a law firm interview or an interview with a judge or something carrying a manila folder. Right. Uh, you know, that. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but it's not, you want to be thinking about making a professional impression. So but you probably don't need to invest in a briefcase, but I would think about something that you can carry basic things like your resume, writing sample, notepad, pen, pencil, whatever, um, in an interview type situation. Yeah, I think that that's true. And again, I, I do think 
know, bulkier isn't always better because you also don't want to be like, sh- if you can help it, sh- like schlepping a bunch of stuff from interview to interview, from room to room, if you're moving around or even, I mean, if you're doing on-campus interviewing, depending on where the on-campus interviewing actually happens, I mean, my on-campus interviewing happened at school during the day. So I had to show up with my backpack full of stuff and my suit, <laughs> but I was between classes and they understood that. But when I went to a callback, I either just had a handbag with me that was big enough that I could put my leather folio in with my resume. Um, but I wouldn't bring all of my large stuff because it just, it can make you feel awkward because you're trying to track all your stuff. And it it's better to be a little minimalist and look very um, like you have it all together, you know, at least present right. that. I mean, <laughs> so even if it's exactly. not true. Like it, right. I mean, I mean, think about if you bring a briefcase to an interview, what you're going to like slap it down on their desk and like <laughs> open it and give them your resume. Right. I mean, come on. And, you're not do and that. what have you got in it? Like a bottle of water? <laughs> you know? Yeah. No. So I, mean, I think if you're a guy listening to this, you want to bring to an interview, you know, you want to be prepared with your nice leather folio. Yeah. If you're a woman listening to it, you can bring that. But if you feel more comfortable, you could also bring, you know, a professional looking handbag that could fit things like your resume into it. Yeah, exactly. All right. So I think that that's kind of all the advice I have on like stuff to carry other things in. What about you? Do you have any other thoughts yeah. on things you should buy? No, I just think, you know, I would encourage people to be practical here. That it's one thing, take my advice, you you can look cool or you can save your shoulder and probably, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> probably ultimately like you want to, you, you're going to save on your lifetime chiropractic bills if you have something that's actually practical to carry your bags in or if you deign to use your locker. <laughs> Don't worry, everyone yeah. else will be doing it. You will not be the only uncool one who's like trying to remember your locker combination. Exactly. And nobody's going to care if you have a locker, maybe except Allison, but nobody else. Yeah, I mean, I might be silently judging you, but I'll also be jealous because you only have one book and I'm carrying like four Right, books. exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. So now we've talked about all the stuff that fits in a bag. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot on the podcast, we talk a lot about it on the blog, is the importance of handwriting, handwriting notes, handwriting briefs. Um, we have other podcasts on preparing for class and why handwriting notes can be helpful for that, so um, we actually recommend that you invest in some nice notebooks. And Allison, do you want to talk about our favorite notebooks ever? Sure. Well, Lee and I are both obsessed with these Circa notebooks. They're by a company called Lavenger, I think it's called. I never know how to pronounce that. But uh, they make these amazing notebooks that you can actually assemble yourself. And so you can take out pages, you can move them around. Uh, you know, so I think something like that is a really nice cross between just a yellow notepad where you're taking notes and then what do you do with them? You know, what if you want to add something? What if you need to look at them all? I mean, I like to sort of take things out and look at them, you know, spread them out Mm -hmm. on the floor and get an overall view. If you're that type of person, these are amazing. Um, Yeah. So I also like the fact that you can buy one of the hole punches that fits their kind of little notebooks. So if you're getting handouts from class or, um, you know, you've printed something out that you want to keep or photocopied something, you can insert it in. So it's like a binder and a notebook combined. Yeah, it's super cool. And you can buy kind of this like intro pack that gives you sort of the idea. A lot of the pages are also already marked up um, with things like the Cornell note taking method, which we have some blog posts about where you take the main part of your notes in the main section, but then you have stuff on the side and a sidebar and at the bottom. And that's where you, you know, do your wrap up for the day and key points and things like that. So, you know, if you're somebody who's thinking about taking notes by hand, there are other options besides just a spiral bound notebook that you scribble uh-huh. into. Um, and uh-huh. it can, re- you know, I think it can really improve your efficiency and almost make it more like taking notes on a computer with the benefits of taking them by hand, but then also some of the benefits of the computer where you can move things around and look at them, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think they're great. I mean, there's really no downside to these other than they're a little pricey, yeah. but uh, they are a little know. pricey. But, you know, sometimes the things that are lightest and easier to manage can be pricey. <laughs> That's a Yeah, that and happens. you know, the paper quality is high, so you can write with pen on it and the pen doesn't bleed through. You know, if you're somebody uh-huh. who likes, who, who cares about handwriting, they're actually a really amazing tool. 
Once you start thinking about all of these things that you have to carry, I think the other nice thing about the Circa notebooks is they're going to end up being lighter than binders for each class, which um, one of the reasons why I think students are hesitant to handwrite is just dealing with all the paper and the weight of that. Well, and, and the space. Like a binder takes up a lot of space. Yeah. And um, I would not want to go back to binder days myself because let's talk about throwback to junior high and high school <laughs> but a trapper keeper or something like that do they even still make those but <laughs> loved my trapper keeper that was like I'm a life sure highlight just picking out the new trapper keeper every year <laughs> i know but um so i think that you know a circa notebook is kind of an updated way that you can still get the benefits of a binder without with the bulk and the weight from it um I know Ariel on our team also really likes to use um ste- i think they're steno pads is that how you say it um, I think so. Which are, yeah, which are the pads of paper with kind of a line down the middle and they're usually a spiral on top. And she has um, seen students be successful with kind of briefing on the left side of a sheet of paper and then taking class notes on the right side. So again, it's a way to kind of keep your class notes organized and contained, you know, a sheet for each case, which I think is another good idea. But then you have to figure out how you're going to keep them all organized, you know, with additional class notes after class. And and that's one of the things that I like about the Circa Notebook is after class, you could reorganize stuff. So you clearly know, you know, this was the universe of what was covered today. And now I'm done and I can move to the next thing. Yeah, I think just the flexibility, I think it solves one of the main problems of, you know, old school notebooks, which is just, it's kind of a stream of consciousness. And once you've done that, you're kind of, unless you, you know, take them out, but then what do you do? Because then you've got 18 million pieces of paper flying around your room with no no page numbers or anything. Right. <laughs> Not a recipe right. for, for good things happening. You know, the other thing that's kind of nice about using a notebook like the Circa Notebook, you can also use it to keep to-do lists and things like that. So everything oh, yeah, is have, like, really housed in one place. Yeah, they have special, you know, paper for your to-do lists and things like that that you can move through. I mean, it's actually a whole system. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. You can have, they have entire systems for all kinds of things. So it's worth checking, mm-hmm. checking out the website if you're interested. We should totally get a commission, but we don't. We don't, but we just, we love them and we just keep buying stuff from them. <laughs> so. It's like so exciting when, when a new stuff, or a new set arrives. It's like, oh, because I have all these different, you get different colors and oh, yeah. it's so it's just it's nice. It's good stuff. It is. It's very nice. It's good stuff. Um, all right. Well, another staple of the law school existence is, are the highlighters. Um and you're probably going to use a lot of them. Um, I think one thing that many people don't think about with highlighters is that you are likely going to need a variety of colors. Um, you may feel a little nerdy or geeky buying a pack of highlighters that has a bunch of colors, but they can, that's a really effective way to organize book briefing. And I know, Allison, you were big into book briefing. Did you have a highlighting scheme for book briefing? Oh, for sure. I mean, you want to pick your color scheme up front and stick with that so that, you know, for me, I think the facts were always underlined in green. Legal reasoning was yellow. I think the holding was orange or pink. I can't remember. You know, one of those was for dissents. But point being, you don't want to do the facts in green in one case and blue in the next case and yellow in the next case. Like, that's complete insanity. Uh, pick, mm-hmm. pick a color scheme and stick to it. The other thing, kind of like with the Circa notebooks, it's worth it to actually invest. I mean, this sounds crazy, but you want to invest in, like, quality highlighters. True. Um, you know, anything like that that's a minimal, minimal difference in cost, but can make a huge difference in your daily experience of, I mean, some of them have like bad fumes or they dry out or, you know, you can, you want to be able to, you know, people have different preferences about the thickness. I mean, this sounds crazy, but you actually want to sort of go to the, go to the bookshop, go to a nice pen store and sort of evaluate, okay, this is the highlighter for me. And then, mm-hmm. then you're and same with pens and pencils. I mean, these are things you're going to be using. Are you a person who prefers to write in pencil? Do you want a mechanical pencil? Do you want to sharpen mm-hmm. your pencils? What kind of pen do you want? Do you want a ballpoint pen? Do you want a, you know, whatever it is. You probably do actually have preferences on this, which again, sounds kind of crazy. But for me, I mean, anywhere I go in the world, I have a certain type of pen with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think... When you do a lot of handwriting and a lot of highlighting, you do get picky with your pens, especially in the case books, because the paper that they use in the case books um, can be somewhat slippery. Sometimes it's like a glossy. Or it can be, like they're all, 
It can be really thin. different ones. It can also be really thin. And so the other reason maybe to have a try out a couple different types of highlighters or ink pens is if you're book briefing, you can't have, you know, a blue highlighter bleeding through the page if you're trying to use a highlighting scheme <laughs> with right. colors. That's not going to work. And you can't have your ink pen bleeding through or smearing. That was a problem I had in one of my case books. It would smear if your mm. hand went across it. So you had to make sure that, like, you were using the right type of pen that wouldn't smear. So um, it's it sounds silly, but... If you're, for me, it was one of these things. If my case book was a total mess, it was anxiety inducing. Right. <laughs> Maybe that's my like slight OCD tendencies. So it was important to me that the highlighters were like clean and didn't bleed through and were very bright and that my ink pen didn't smudge every time I, you know, moved a hand across the page. Right. That's why I always, in my case books, I always read with a pencil and highlighters. So my case books, ah. unless I want, Unless I wanted to make like a special note or something, I never use mm-hmm. pen because I found it just made too big a mess. Yeah, that's interesting. So the nice thing is you can try a few things out and maybe it's worth having a few before you buy in bulk, like at Costco, have a few that you try out to see what works in your case books. And then um, one of the things I was going to talk about a little bit later was the beauty of like Amazon subscribe and save and things like that. Right. <laughs> that if you know that you're burning through highlighters, you know, really quickly, you can just make it so highlighters will be delivered to your house on a regular basis. And that might save you trips to Office Depot or remembering to have to um, purchase things, um, you know, just when you get busy. So it's something to think about is pick your preferred things and then make it very easy for you to have a well-stocked home with them. Right. I mean, you don't want to be running out of certain colors of highlighters in the middle of your reading sessions. So Mm -hmm. it's one of those things you always want to have a backup supply. And if it's getting low, restock in advance so that this does not become a reason that you cannot sit down and do your reading. Right. And it's amazing how it might sound silly if you haven't started law school yet, that if you didn't have the right highlighters and (laughs) and pen that you wouldn't want to do your reading. But really, you know... That moment will come and you're like, but if I don't have my stuff, I can't do the reading. It, it's not that crazy when you think about it. No, you just want to make sure you're prepared so that that does not become an excuse for why you're falling behind is that you do not have your pink highlighter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So now you know what to write with. Um, one of the other things that I mentioned earlier was that at my school, I used to take lunch um to school sometimes i should have taken it all the time because i end up spending ended up spending way too much money on really crummy food that was in this little like cafe thing they had as part of my law school um but or spending too much money like going down and eating burritos all the time which doesn't do good things for you either (laughs) so um so one of the things that you want to think about is how you're going to eat and depending on your school and its location Um, you might find yourself needing to bring food to school. And if that's true, then you need, spoken like a true mom, you need a lunchbox. You probably need more than one. You need those little ice pack things to keep things cool. You have to find out whether or not you have a microwave that you can access. Or if not, you have to make sure you bring cold food. Um, I'm a big fan of like little glass or stainless steel containers. Uh, You can go to a great website that we also don't create commission for called life without plastic i think is what it's called but they have great lunch containers and food containers if you don't want to keep buying reusable things or if you want to have reusable things but you don't want to make it hard to get yourself fed and to school um because if you don't eat well you're going to get more fatigued and it's going to be harder to do what you need to do so if you know that's your reality then you know spend a little bit of time thinking about what you need and how you're going to feed yourself and make sure you have all the stuff that you need to feed yourself every day at school yeah absolutely and i think you know they've developed a lot since the days of the aluminum lunch boxes with a thermos, oh, yes. thermos that I used to carry in elementary school. Uh, you know, these, these have become pretty sophisticated these days, I think. Yeah. Um, so something to think about, something to, you know, put on your wish list for family members if they want to know. That's that's a that's a way to really send your uh, family members for a loop. They're like, how can I help you get ready for law school? You're like, I need a lunch box <laughs> and some stainless steel <laughs> food containers. <laughs> That would be really helpful. Thanks. <laughs> That's so cute. And then you're like, you can buy some for my kids too, so they can we can all have matching lunches when we go to school each day. It really does feel like that. It's kind of crazy. Oh well, these are all the uh, yes. things you need to consider. 
Um, exactly. And it's a great way to save money. And, you know, budgeting is a huge part of the law school experience. And if you're feeling like you're running out of money, spending money on food, especially food you might not be enjoying, which a lot of, you know, just grabbing food when you're out isn't like a treat. It's just to feed yourself may not be the place where you want to spend your disposable income. Right. And I think if you pack it yourself, you're probably going to be eating a lot more nutrient dense foods. You know, you can make it a habit where you do this twice a week or something. You know, you pack three days of lunch on Sunday. Um, Someone I know who's a personal trainer is always posting these amazing Instagram shots of like what she's packing for her lunch that week. And, you know, it's a lot of stuff where you're like, huh, I'd like to eat that. I mean, I know. you know, do I know where to go buy it? No, but that actually looks pretty delicious. <laughs> yeah. I actually have a personal trainer friend as well who um, she will freeze some of her smoothies early in the week. Like she'll make a huge batch of green smoothies and freeze them so she can have like green smoothies every morning without having to make them, um, which I thought was kind of a a really ingenious idea. Um, Again, I've never frozen smoothies, but (laughs) it's a nice idea. Uh, But meal prep and, you know, planning food is, is really a big part of getting ready for the bar, getting ready for the bar, but getting ready to um, go to school because um, those little life annoyances can make a big difference. If you're stressing about, about food or you're sick because you're eating crummy food or you're just eating the free pizza at school, it can be a major issue. Right. And I think this is also something to think about. What are you going to have in your house? You know, if you're mm-hmm. think you're, if you're a person who makes smoothies and that's something that you value, you're going to need a way to do that. You know, so again, like the what do you need to help start law school could be I need a really good blender. <laughs> you know? It's true. Because, I am in love with my Vitamix. I will be honest. When I found out it could clean itself, it just like changed everything. Wow. Yeah, I had the... Yeah. Um, I had some bullet thing that I liked. I can't remember what it was, but I liked that one because it had like a screw on top where you could just have like a cup size of stuff. Oh and yeah, those are pretty cool. You didn't have to. You didn't have to wash the whole blender. All you had to do was basically rinse off the cup and rinse off the part that turns around, and you were done. Yeah, the Vitamix. When what was a game changer for me was that you. It has like a self cleaning setting, and so you just put water and soap and push this button. And it goes so fast and creates enough, I guess it's friction, I I don't know what you would call the speed of the water, to self-clean. And then you just dump it out, rinse it out. Yeah, amazing. So that really lowers the smoothie stress. (laughs) (laughs) Because I really, I stopped making smoothies because my old blender would take forever to clean. That was one of the things I didn't like about it. I have other friends who make soups in them and do a lot of like bulk meal cooking. Uh, The um, immersion blender for soup. The immersion blender is like life changing. Again, nice. because all you have to do is rinse it. Done. You know, if yeah. you if you're if you're gonna make soup, if you're gonna make any kind of thing like that, definitely the immersion blender is the way to go. Nice. We also have um, a former tutor on our team wrote about the slow cooker. Oh, they're right, the crock for pot. Him. <laughs> yeah. The crock pot. Um, but again, if you're trying to cook in bulk, slow cookers or a crock pot, um, or I know right now it's the Instapot, which is very hot um, around food circles on social media that I follow. Um, but, you know, the ability to cook a bunch of food and eat it all week is really a game changer. Yeah, I had a Korean roommate in law school, and she was my first exposure to the wonders of a really decent rice cooker. Life-changing. Oh, yeah. Turns out you can mm-hmm. make all kinds of stuff in a rice cooker. And again, like, you just put your stuff in, you push the button, you go study for half an hour, you come back, and your rice is ready. Yeah, we used to steam vegetables in our rice cooker. Yeah, you could do all kinds of things like oatmeal, mm-hmm. quinoa, you know, and that's better than standing over a pot. Yeah, yeah, overnight oats are one of my new favorite things. Do you ever do this? No. Where you soak oats overnight in either like coconut milk or almond milk instead of cooking them. And then they are like mushy deliciousness. Mm. Totally worth Googling overnight oats. No, I do. I, I actually do my steel cut oats in the rice cooker. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> All right, well, now I'm like totally hungry. I definitely I did not eat enough for lunch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, let's stop, let's okay. stop talking about food. Um, Sounds good. Oh, one thing we should definitely touch on that we have not talked about yet on our shopping list is do people need to rush out and get a new laptop? Oh, please don't. Um, I think that a lot of people feel like they need new technology for law school, and I don't think you do. I think, in fact, waiting to find out 
um, what kind of technology you really need is more important. It's, it's likely now that everybody has some sort of a working laptop and that's probably going to get you through at least a good chunk of law school. What um, I like to have people keep in mind is that you will be probably taking the bar on that laptop as well. And you may not want a three or four year old laptop, depending on when you decide to buy your new laptop for law school, um, be the one that you're taking to the bar because it may not be as stable as kind of a newer laptop that you might buy midway through law school. So I think if you can hold off, I don't think it's something that you need to do, especially if you're not going to take notes in your laptop in class, which we don't recommend that you do. Right. I think sometimes you, if you do want to buy a new laptop, you definitely want to be clear on what is going to be allowable for you to use on your exams. Because yes. not every type of computer, probably still, you essentially, if you want to take your exams in most law schools in class on a laptop, you have to install special software and different schools use different software. Sometimes the mm -hmm. software does not work very well, um, and sometimes it does not work on certain types of computers. So before you invest several thousand dollars in your brand new fancy computer, just double and triple check with your law school, like, okay, am I going to be able to use this? And a lot of them, I think, will probably send out some information on this. Just make sure mm -hmm. you understand it. And But I think your point that if you have something that's sort of okay, that you can continue using for your your first year or so, that's going to put you in a better position not to have to rush out and buy a laptop just to take the bar. And there's so many startup costs to law school. I mean, all this stuff that we're talking about here, including books and you might be relocating. If you can push off a new technology by till the next summer when maybe you could get another part-time job or something like that, that could make a huge difference in how much money you feel like you're kind of bleeding in this first uh, part of law school. Yeah, particularly if you're moving across the country, you know, you're paying deposits. I mean, it can get extremely expensive. And a lot of times you're just not going to have that cash on hand to go buy yourself, you know, a several thousand dollar laptop. Right. I also think that if you don't have an iPad or another type of tablet that, again, unless you know how you're going to use it, you don't need to invest in something new like that. Um, oftentimes students really like having paper books, um, even with supplements, um, or things like that, because you can mark them up, you can even share them with a friend, maybe you can split costs, which can be kind of nice. So until you know that you're going to need a new iPad for law school, don't go buy, you know, a lot of extra technology. I think it's technology is always available now. It's not like you you can walk into the Apple store or order a Kindle at any moment <laughs> right. like at your fingertips. And it's always getting better. You know, if you wait a year, you're going to get something better for the same cost. So, or you're going to have the option right. of getting, you know, the second second most, most uh, current generation at a significantly reduced cost. So it's like a used car. You know, if you drive the new mm -hmm. car off the lot, it instantly loses value. So if you can delay buying this new iPad or buying the new computer, you know, you're probably going to, in the end, getting a better quality product for less. Yep, that's very true. So, you know, writing it out as long as you can is probably a good idea. I think the one situation that some people find themselves in, which is something that I found myself in, was that I didn't have an up-to-date personal computer before I was applying to law school because I used a company laptop and I traveled for work all the time. So I actually had to buy a computer to just do all of my law school applications <laughs> because I felt like I couldn't use my company laptop for that. And um, so I kind of felt forced into doing it. But the, And then I had a four-year-old computer when it came time to um, sit for the bar. I think a lot of people may not find themselves in the exact same spot. I think now, you know, just to date myself, I think everybody pretty much has some sort of a laptop. But it is just something to think about, you know, if you are turning in technology that somebody else owns, you might find yourself not having technology you're used to having. Right. And you're going to need something. And the other thing to think about is whether it's possible for you to buy some sort of, you know, protection plan for this new laptop if mm -hmm. you get it. Uh, because the worst thing is when suddenly you're in the middle of the semester, your hard drive dies you don't have the money to fix it. You know, you don't know where to go to fix it. Anything you can do in advance, even if it costs you a little bit more money up front, is probably worth doing just to decrease your hassle level. Like for me, for example, my laptop decided to die literally the afternoon before I had to fly to San Francisco for a law firm interview. Um, but I'd had the foresight at that point to buy a sort of like, we'll come to you and fix it plan, which of course no one would sell you anymore. 
And they mm-hmm. literally sent a technician to my hotel in San Francisco, fixed it. I think they even had to come back the next day because they didn't have the right part or something. So, you know, basically they fixed the entire thing and then I was up and running again. So, yeah, you know, these things always happen at the worst possible time. And the other thing, please, oh, please, so please, true. please, 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 please back up your work. Oh, yes. Dropbox. It's free. You don't even have to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Like back up on, you know, back up on an external hard drive. That's an excellent investment of $100. Back up to Dropbox. Do it automatically. You know, just have a Dropbox folder on your computer that you save every important document to and it just automatically syncs. Like do that. Yeah. Please do that. Do that. Yep, <laughs> do it. Because we don't want to hear anyone listening to this podcast tell the story of lost work, which, um, gosh, doesn't matter how long technology's around, like work just gets lost. I even had a friend uh, who posted to Facebook that she's working on her dissertation and she'd been using Scrivener, uh, which is oh, a oh god, which um, crashed my computer like eighteen million times. I had to stop using right, it. Right, but it is a great program if you can keep it working. But she had been writing her dissertation in Scrivener, and then she had she converted it to Word, and Scrivener automatically saves. Word doesn't to the same extent, and then her computer crashed in Word, and she lost a bunch of changes in her dissertation. Heartbreaking. Yeah. that's so, also something. Don't l- do that. A lot of the yeah, a lot of the times that's a setting that you need to set up in something like Word is tell it how often to save, and you might assume mm-hmm. it's saving because I mean we're all used to working in the cloud now. Like if I'm sending an email in Mailchimp, it saves every twenty seconds. Word doesn't do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just think about it. Um, another yeah. thing people on the technology front may be interested in is if you're going to take notes on a laptop, you might want to consider some sort of note-taking software. Some, if you can get Scrivener running, it's fantastic. However, it might crash your computer a lot. Um, people like Microsoft OneNote. A lot of people like Evernote. Anything like this that you know is going to help streamline your note-taking just out of using a Word document is probably mm-hmm. a good use of time and energy to figure out what that might be for you. Yeah. And using other technology tools that you might want to learn before the semester starts that can help keep you organized. So um, Trello, of course, we talk about a lot because we love them. And we think that they can be used for a lot of different things is probably another good one to try out. But you might want to play with some of these tools. I mean, the nice thing about Evernote and Trello is they're free. So you can decide if they make sense for like your thought process and how you want to organize um, notes or other life tasks. Um, Most of these also sync to your phone and have some sort of an app so you can access them from multiple locations. Um, So anyway, worth checking out and playing with, but we still recommend you take notes by hand whenever possible. Right. Read our blog post. Um, And finally, one last big topic before we wrap up. What about whether people should be getting their supplements right now? You know, supplements are something that I would really hold off on until you're in school and you can get more information. Sometimes professors will have supplements that they recommend for a class. Sometimes upperclassmen will send down through the chains of communication what supplements are good for certain classes. Um, But investing in a bunch of supplements and filling your bookcases is not a great place to start. No, and sometimes you'll get to school and you'll find out, like, I think at Columbia they had, for example, this amazing day where one of the organiz- one of the student organizations would get donations of supplements from upper class people and then sell them for something ridiculous, like a dollar each. Mm-hmm. So if you happen to know about this and go at the right time and you happen to see, I mean, it was amazing what you could get. I'm not sure I ever actually got any because I was always like, oh, God, did that happen yesterday? Um, but if you're, if, you're, if you're on top of it, there's definitely a possibility that you will be able to get drastically reduced price supplements that there's no reason to go out mm-hmm. and spend $40 on right now. Yeah. Okay, I have two more quick things I'm going to add to the shopping list, though, okay, before we go. sure. Because I know we're running on – I will be quick. One is if you don't have any business-appropriate attire in your closet, try and get some because you never know when you're going to get invited to a networking event at your school or, or an engagement to hear a speaker, and you need to show up not in a fleece and jeans, which is what I wore to law school every day. <laughs> so make sure you have something in your closet, like, pressed and cleaned and ready to go kind of at any time, don't you think? Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. And if you're coming, especially from undergrads, you might feel like you don't really have a lot of that clothing. So just make sure that you've got some good stuff in your closet. And um, if you're setting up a new home, really think about 
um, buying things in bulk or how to stock up at the beginning of the summer so you are not constantly running to the store. If you have space, if you don't have a lot of space, really look into Amazon Subscribe and Save. It's kind of life-changing. You can get like paper towels and toilet paper and toothbrush heads and even snack foods delivered to your front door on a regular basis, and then you never run out of anything. This is was like recommended to me by a mom friend, and it's kind of life-changing. Yeah, I think it's just worth thinking of your system for keeping yourself well-stocked, for keeping your home organized, for keeping your life organized. Investing a little bit of time up front and kind of developing a process for how you're going to make sure your house is well-stocked and make sure that you can carry your books and things like that, I think really will pay dividends in the end. You're just going to be happier, you're going to be healthier, and you're going to be a lot more effective. Yeah, and you don't have to keep all of those lists of things that you're running out of in your head. Drives you crazy. There's like an exhaustion element from that. For sure. All right, well, with that, we are out of time. But before we finish up, we just wanted to take a second to let you know that you can check out our Start Law School Write course at our website at lawschooltoolbox.com slash start-law-school-write. And this on-demand course, which is going to include feedback from one of our awesome Law School Toolbox tutors, We'll help you understand how to excel academically from day one and make sure that, you know, you have everything you need to get started in law school. You can check it out online and feel free to contact us if you have any questions about the program. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at Lee at LawSchoolToolbox.com or Allison at LawSchoolToolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at LawSchoolToolbox.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk soon.